Okay, so welcome to the Hamster Colloquium series. My name is Stefan Bittner. Um, the Hamster Colloquium series is a series of invited talks by, uh, in which we invite distinguished speakers from universities around the world. Um, so today we have the pleasure of uh, uh, being able to invite uh, Hilol Kagupta, who is a professor uh, at the University of Maryland, to speak about um, big data analytics, especially for connected cars. Um, I have uh, his bio here also, I can read a bit more in detail. So, uh, our speaker today is Hilolka Gupta. He's a professor of computer science at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, he is a co founder and president of Agnic, a vehicle performance data analytics company for mobile distributed and embedded environments. He received his PhD in computer science from University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign in 1996. Uh, his research interests include mobile and distributed data mining. Um, Dr. Kargupta is an IEEE Fellow. He won the IBM Innovation Award in 2008 and the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2001 for his research on ubiquitous and uh, distributed data mining. He and his team received the 2010 Frost and Sullivan Enabling Technology of the Year Award for the Mindfleet Vehicle Performance Data Mining Product and the IEEE Top 10 Data Mining Case Studies Award. His other awards include the Best Paper Award for the 2003 IEEE International Conference on Data Mining for a paper on privacy preserving data mining, the 2000 TRW Foundation Award, and the 1997 Los Alamos Award for Outstanding Technical Achievements. So, welcome, Hilol. The floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Stefan, uh, for the kind words, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about um, data analytics for for connected connected cars. You know, so that's the title of the presentation. Um, I so my plan is to uh, is to give a not so technical talk, so it'll have enough technical cues and some algorithmic stuff you know, toward the end. Um, but you know, it's going to be a blend of um, uh, business perspective um, uh, and my experience in the industry in the recent few years you know, coming from the academia. Um, so it's, a bl it's going to be a blend of um, technical stuff with, um, with business stuff. Okay. So, in terms of the the, the roadmap, you know, initially, you know, I will try to motivate you uh, in the first few minutes that this is indeed an interesting area for particularly the young graduate students who are you know, working in this area. So, I want to talk about that a little bit and, and why machine to machine and connected car is indeed an interesting area to be in. And uh, so, my first few slides are going to be on that. And then you know, I'm going to talk about uh, um, some of the recent work that we have been doing in the connected cars area, you know, how and why big data analytics you know, is important. Um, gradually, I'm going to get into specifics. Um, and to the end, I'm going to pick up uh, um, a couple of examples and uh, drill down further and, and see the, what kind of challenges we faced and how we solved them uh, and what we learned from our mistakes. So that's sort of the agenda that I have. Okay. So this particular slide that I'm going to start with, you know, it's um, is a it's a slide on on the economics. Um, so the the field of machine to machine usually refers to devices connected over, over wireless networks, and um, and the different services that we build on top of that. So, so connected cars, you know, as, as you connect them over the wireless network, you know, kind of belong to that uh, general, general vertical. And M2M is, is really now full of activities. The first generation of you know, companies that came to the market you know, for machine-to-machine -machine environments, they're more about infrastructure. You know, how do you sort of build a device? You know, how do you connect them over the wireless networks? It was mostly about that, but now what's happening is that you know for many of these verticals, the infrastructure is you know, is in place, 
and so you don't have to spend money in, 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 on the hardware side a lot. Uh, but now you can develop interesting software applications on top of that. So, um, you know, this slide essentially talks about you know, some of the market size data um, and according to Accenture, you know, which is a major global consulting company, by, um, uh, this is you know, taken from one of my earlier slides, you know, so it is around $80 billion market today. Um, uh, is pretty close to that and 2014 it will be um, more than that actually. Um, and the analytics side of the story, this is a, a market research from ABI research, you know, uh, so, so the analytics market right now for machine to machine is um, it's uh, close to about 10 billion, it's going to be around you know, 14 billion by 2018. Um, and uh, so this is an indeed an, an interesting time for doing analytics and building innovative software applications for machine to machine environments, including connected cars. This slide talks about, you know, it gives you a few examples of the recent uh, margin acquisitions that's been happening in this vertical over the last few months. And this will tell you a little bit um, about the Wall Street activities you know, today. Um, Verizon, which is a major um, US-based uh, network, wireless networking company, they bought a telematics infrastructure company called Hughes Telematics for 612 million a few months ago. Um, the Sirius Satellite Radio Company, they bought a telematics company called Ajero, uh, based on you know, Boston for 530 million. Qualcomm recently sold its telematics infrastructure company for 800 million. And just last week, um, a Russian company um, called Renova Group, uh, they're an infrastructure and real estate company, bought um, an Italian telematics company for 550 million. So it's, it's a pretty interesting market right now. Every other week, a, a major deal is happening. So, so what, I'm, what I try to do is that in those couple of slides, I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the things that are happening in terms of you know, uh, transactions. So a lot of money is getting into these things. Almost all major European telecom companies, you, know, uh, you name it, you know, Dutch Telecom, you know, T-Mobile, and all those, Vodafone, um, they all have a strong M2M component. They all have a major effort right now in the connected car. So what I'm going to do is that uh, hopefully now that I kind of uh, drew attention from the, the financial side, I want to talk about uh, connected cars more specifically. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the role of analytics um, that, um, uh, that the market is realizing uh, slowly but steadily. And how, um, you know, uh, someone from the academia with um, little experience in the in this in this vertical from the industrial side uh, can create, you know, uh, value um, and my my experience in that. So that's the agenda for the next uh, uh, set of slides that I'm going to share with you. Okay. So, so why is it an interesting academic problem? So you take cars for the sake of rest of these discussions connected over wireless networks and there are plenty of you know quote unquote big data companies or data analytics companies you know you name it you know IBM's of the world uh, uh, the SAPs you know SAS and SPSS you know there are so plenty of um, large you know data analytics companies so what's the need here why is it any any different so if you look at the the traditional architecture for data analytics today um, it's primarily very centralized. So you have, let's say, market basket data or, or, or in a grocery chain data that's coming in, uh, connected over you know, big pipes. So you bring in all the data to a data warehouse, analyze that, you know, build a vertical uh, application on top of your data warehouse. That's the traditional architecture for doing data analytics in, um, in the conventional um, data analytics you know, platforms. So this diagram essentially shows that, like in your different data sources, bring in all these things on your, to your data warehouse and then do data analytics on top of that. So most of the commercial systems for doing data mining today um, are like that. So my claim is that this doesn't quite fit very well with the world of machine to machine, uh, particularly connected cars. And why so? So if you look at uh, uh, machines connected over wireless network, uh, like in you know, a connected car environments, most of these wireless connectivities, you know, they are low bandwidth connectivities. 
okay um, and and although your cell phone might have an unlimited data plan but in real world there is nothing called unlimited data plan they cap it okay and uh, uh, and uh, because otherwise you know uh, the, the the vendor will have to pay unlimited amount of you know, money for the transaction so they kind of estimate how much you spend you know how much you spend in terms of your, your you know bandwidth consumption and they kind of cap it when it comes to machines they cap it too okay and if you're going to download in a huge amount of data or upload huge amount of data from these machines uh, then somebody has to write that check okay so your car you know is really a big data environment you know most of the modern cars have tens of thousands of sensors and most of the oems today don't really do much with those sensors in terms of analytics so they would typically you know download only a small part of this data to their back-end cloud if the vehicle is in a uh, telematics infrastructure connected to a wireless network in a, in a commercially, if you have to launch a program, you have to pay attention to that communication cost. So the, my argument is that fundamentally it's a very distributed environment, in a distributed computing environment connected over wireless network. Um, they're connected over low bandwidth wireless networks. That's the second point. Third point is a large volume of data literal. There's no question about it. Okay, if you take just a simple accelerometer sense sensor that your phone has, like when you take your smartphone, tilt the phone, the image changes, that's done based on an accelerometer. So a three axis accelerometer would generate three floating point numbers every time you sample it. And for many of these applications, you have to sample it at a pretty high, fast rate, like in a 25 hertz and a 50 hertz, uh, if you're interested in driver behavior monitoring. That means 50 samples per second. You do the math. 50 samples per second, three floating point um, numbers in a per, per sample, and I, that can generate in a tens of megs of data per hour. So it's a really a, uh, in a big data problem. And hard to centrally collect in you know, all that raw data, expensive to do that, and also not very scalable. Uh, when you're bringing in data from thousands and thousands of vehicles on, on a, a continuous basis, um, you know, scalability is a big, big uh, concern. Uh, you know, privacy is another important aspect, and we'll talk about that later. So my point is that you know, you're dealing with a very distributed environment where um, data, uh, a large volume of data is generated on board the vehicle. So you have two choices. One is like you know bringing all the data to the backend you know, uh, environment, uh, the cloud environment that you have, or um, do some computation on board. So, so you know depending on what application you're talking about, you probably need some balance between these two. You know, do some short-term analytics on board the vehicle and do long-term analysis and comparative analytics in the backend. So typically you need a blend of those. So, so it is kind of different from the traditional uh, big data platforms that you see. And that's where like a lot of innovations come and come in. Okay. And that's what's happening in the market. Okay. So there are a lot of opportunities to open up new enterprises on that. So this slide essentially kind of summarizes what I just talked about, that big data analytics for cars, there's an onboard component and a back-end cloud-based analytics. Um, so, so that's all this slide is about. Okay, so they put some cool graphics. Uh, I gotta get rid of this stuff. Um, all right, so, um, so, so this is, in a, now that I kind of uh, argued that, you know, fundamentally doing data analytics in connected cars um, deals with, you know, you know uh, distributed problems, distributed algorithms. So it's a distributed environment. And, and so the question is like, what kind of algorithms we would really need, you know, for doing data analytics? If I have to do a multivariate, you know, a regression, you know, for connected cars, can I use my standard you know, off-the-shelf algorithm for uh, doing regression or do I need a different kind of things? Now, note that we are talking about distributed computing where you have, you know, you're going to involve on board stuff and then you're going to involve in the, your backend stuff. Now, you can create heuristic-based different kind of techniques and then say, okay, I'm going to, you know, build some partial models on board, on board the vehicle and then send those models to the, the backend. The question is, what do you really mean by partial models? Okay, so fortunately, there is a, in a body of literature over the last, you know, last 15 years or so. Uh, there's a, in a, in a team of researchers from different parts of the world contributed to the development of this field called distributed data mining, which deals with data analysis in a distributed environment, peer-to-peer -peer environments, things like that. 
So you don't have to start from scratch. There is still a lot of opportunity for doing a lot of interesting stuff there. We're barely scratch, but there is a you know, body of literature there. So just to give you a little bit of history, um, in back in 1998, you know, uh, you know, we sort of started the, the first distributed data mining workshop in in, in ACM Security. Uh, back then, it was not a part of ACM, uh, and. Uh, um, so, so, so there's a you know, the, you know, the European Union, for example, spent a lot of resources on that. There's a, there's a project you know that European Union funded in 2005 for promoting data mining in ubiquitous environment called KDUBIC. Uh, there are a whole bunch of European institutions that are part of um, this. Um, so, so just um, wanted to give a little bit of history, and you know, while I'm at that note, I also wanted to share a little bit of um, um, where we started from. Um, so, back in 2001, you know, uh, you know, uh, some of my graduate students were sort of like you know, putting together kind of uh, homegrown, uh, uh, you know, uh, PCBs, you know, just for fetching some of the, the data from from vehicles, um, and um, uh, and this was, the, believe it or not, this was the GPS module for that. And um, in 2005, like you know, uh, I don't know if you guys remember still those PDAs that came out, like you know, so so we were sort of running our platforms based on that. Um, in 2007, some of the things, and, and then you know, I'll talk about. Um, so so we we had to sort of build our, our own system back back in those days, you know, uh, because nobody would let us run uh, our algorithms inside these uh, devices. You know, we uh, we have always interacted with the OEMs, but you know, those of us you know who deal with OEMs, they know that you know, uh, putting a, a, an academic project inside an OEM head unit is you know how difficult it is. By you know, so they wouldn't trust our code, for example. Um, so, so we, we kind of started from there. You know, we spun off a, a company in our technology incubator and to, uh, with a small room with two part-time employees. Uh, we got a $50,000 grant from state of Maryland. So it started from there, okay? And then we started bringing in our um, commercial partners and, to, uh, and today I will sort of um, just you know, uh, point to you towards some of the things that, are, uh, that we're rolling out. Um, this is um, the car connection product you know, for um, AudioVox. This is available through you know, major channels like Sears, for example, which is a major uh, retail chain in, in most US Smalls, you will find them. Uh, this is a consumer market product. Uh, we have um, a commercial fleet and uh, uh, consumer insurance product that Sprint, which is a major uh, telco, telco, telecommunications company uh, in the US, you know, they are selling our stuff. Uh, I'll talk about the insurance market product in a minute. Um, AT&T just recently launched um, uh, our consumer market product in their uh, AT&T store throughout the country in the US. If you walk into an AT&T store, you're going to find this stuff. So we'll talk about some of these things in you know, why um, and, and uh, what kind of analytics power these things pick up some examples. But I just want to give you some examples of the kind of stuff that we are doing today. A uh, bunch of other stuff like that, so I'm going to skip this stuff. Um, so, um, now, so having you know, talked about a little bit of history, where we came from, and then you know, what we're doing today, so I mentioned things like you know, insurance market products, I talked about fleet market products, I talked about consumer market products. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to drill down a little bit and say, okay, what are these products? What do they really do? What do they really do for the fleet market? What do they do for the consumers? Why should somebody pay for some of these things? So, so now uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the platforms, you know, different data sources, things like that, and then gradually move towards the analytics side. So, so typically what we do today, you know, we deal with um, uh, in different types of um, onboard you know, in-vehicle you know, uh, sensor systems so, um, and, and computing platforms. So we have um, the so-called smart devices and um, these are typically based on um, either aftermarket OBD dongles or OEM head units and I will probably, let me see if I can just quickly pull up. So, so these are the kind of aftermarket devices. So this is sort of the the, the AT and T you know device you know on AT and T stores. This is a you know, CDMA device. 
Um, so typically these are aftermarket uh, devices with a GPS chip inside with, uh, with an accelerometer sensor with full OBD support um, that sort of stuff uh, but you know we really don't care where we run these are for aftermarket that plugs into an, uh, a vehicle diagnostic port easily just you just push it in it, it, it gets done they also have you know, typically 3G connect connectivities or CDMA connectivities on the wireless network they have Bluetooth Wi-Fi that sort of stuff but you know we um, we're also getting integrated with in, a, in vehicle built-in head units and things like that so so that's uh, so you're talking about those sort of computing platforms you know there are varieties of different types of you know computing platforms with very limited computing powers to um, devices with you know uh, you know uh, full-blown operating systems uh, uh, with more than 100 megs of storage so depending on what's the the market uh, cost uh, structure we use the appropriate one and in the back end you know we would be using different types of distributed computing environments so these days cloud is a kind of buzzword and I hate buzzwords um, so uh, you know uh, so so there is this traditional uh, structures based on Hadoop or based on spark things like that but fundamentally if you're trying to do real-time data analytics in a Hadoop is not necessarily the best thing to do so we have a data stream management systems in the back end that we do for re triggering real-time services and in vehicle there are like a lot of different types of um, inexpensive um, tags that we use based on NFC uh, you know based on low energy Bluetooth and so those sort of different types of um, hardware platforms you know, to feed in more data in vehicle cameras um, things like that so this slide essentially tries to give you an idea about the different types of computing platforms that we use um, inside the vehicle so a lot of vehicle diagnostic data driver behavior data location data user experience data when you touch um, things on the on the screen on the on the vehicle uh, uh, or, or change your you know uh, settings you know what music you're listening to so so a lot of this user experience data um, are also a part of that story so it's a very data rich environment based on different types of heterogeneous computing platforms so um, so so that's sort of the the platform side of the story source of um, data source side of the story now the question is like you know, okay if I'm going to do analytics then okay there are two things like you know for doing analytics for the you now for the fun part of it and which we do all the time and then coming from the academia that's the core part um, but also we are interested in like you know figuring out like you know, who is willing to write a check for that okay who is willing to pay for it because in the company that's important so um, uh, so if you look at this this stuff over here so these are the stuff that we openly talk about and we have products in these markets today okay so one of the one of them is usage based insurance so almost all major insurance companies globally um, they're you know doing at least something along that area so most US you know, insurance companies and many European insurance companies have usage based insurance programs so what they do is that they they bring in driver behavior data based on the telematics infrastructure and the insurance actuaries would correlate that within a loss data like insurance claims data build predictive models and say hey how risky is your driving okay and based on that they will sort of you know they would say okay this is um, your insurance premium and, and if you're a good driver then you get like in a 15 percent off or 20 percent off from your insurance insu annual insurance premium so in us for example typically in um, a household person would pay that's a thousand bucks um, on average you know per year and if you get like in 20 percent off that means like 200 dollars off so which is good people like that okay so um, uh, so that's a part of the story um, and we have a product for the insurance actuaries and on that market um, and then we have a consumer market product the at t product the audio Vox product you know the uh, some of the other products that we are rolling out and therefore consumer consumer front so over there you know either the consumer is getting for free you know because somebody else like a channel is actually paying for it but at the end of the day the consumer essentially uh, gets a whole lot of things about uh, the car care when is you know what's going on in your car in simple language you know when should you you know take it for a tire rotation things like that um, and then a lot of uh, driver behavior like if you have teenage driver at home like you know where are they and you know how are they driving are they texting while driving do you want to block that that sort of stuff um, 
and a lot of location based uh, location trigger services you know uh, in a lot of couponing stuff like that like you know so that sort of stuff um, commercial fleet side you know this is designed for commercial fleet owners you know somebody has 500 vehicles in their fleet they want to cut down the cost on fuel consumption uh, most commercial fleets spend a lot of money on gas and on you know petroleum and uh, they want to have a safer you know uh, drivers so they want to know uh, about vehicle health you know in that order typically the the return of investment usually comes in that order fuel consumption driver behavior vehicle health so that's um, those are the three components and, and also like some of the locations where the drivers you know what are they doing so that's the part of this commercial fleet side of the story and um, the dealers you know essentially like car dealers they make most of their money from car repairs not by selling cars by the way okay um, and uh, because the margins for selling new car is you know increasing and becoming smaller and smaller it's more competitive so they make lots of money from repairs so they want their customers to come back and you know fix their cars in, in, a, in their service department so now if you get uh, vehicle health data uh, proactively you know before they actually come to your service bay then the idea is that okay can you send them a coupon and say hey if you show up in the next 48 hours I'll give you 15% off and while their competition is in a, is still wondering like you know maybe sending you a coupon for oil change when you really need an oxygen sensor okay so that's the story for this guy this is a full-blown CRM system and that's why a lot of fascinating interesting problems like you know all the, the algorithms for computational advertisements you know the kind of stuff that you see in Amazon the kind of stuff that you see powering Google Ads they kind of get in there okay so that's that's another exciting research area and finally the car OEMs the hardest of the the, the 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 whole bunch, I guess, you know, to crack. And so we have a you know a cloud based data analytic products uh, product for the car OEM. So the, the objective over there, you know, how do you sort of Entirely optimize the, uh, the OEM processes, you know, warranty management, warranty fraud detection, uh, and, and uh, OEMs. You know, uh, initially, if you look at the models like OnStar, uh, where they wanted to charge the car owner monthly subscription fee, thirty bucks a month, and most people didn't want to pay for that kind of. So, so then they figured out that okay, uh, the the car owner shouldn't be charged for that. Rather, they should be charging money from the other types of businesses. So the OEMs. Uh, um, they now have an agenda along each of these directions so they want to spend the, uh, the infrastructure uh, money and then they want to make money from each of these other components so for example OEMs are building relationships with the insurance companies things like that um, if you look at in a GMAC in a GMSC you know part of GM story so 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 a whole bunch of things are happening for OEMs you know connecting with the other verticals there all right so um, so these are some of the, um, the screenshots of our, our product portals. So, so typically you have a web-based interface and, and smartphone apps, things like that. Uh, this is the consumer side. This is the, the dealer front. That's the OEM front. This is the, um, the insurance actual uh, portal. So anyway, so uh, enough stuff. So what I'm going to do next, um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, in a drill down. Let me see how I'm doing it time-wise. Okay. Um, how much time do I have approximately? Yes. Plenty of time, I think. Plenty of time? Okay, good. Let me know. Um, okay, so now I'm, I'm going to um, drill down a little bit and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of the features. Okay, of, uh, I'll, I'll pick and choose from different systems in, a, uh, in order to talk about uh, in a deep analytics and how they are kind of playing a role in this. Thing. So this is um, uh, a, a screenshot uh, from the main landing page of um, uh, of one of our product called Vinx. Uh, you know, uh, you know. So there's a you know a major social side of this thing. So both for commercial fleets and also for the consumer market. Um, there are really fascinating amount of stuff happening when uh, in, the, in the social side like you know when you blend in your telematics data your vehicle performance data with the vehicle location data not just for one vehicle you know connect that with you know, other drivers your friends so I'll give you two examples one from the fleet side the commercial fleet side and the other from the uh, the consumer side so um, 
so, so consider you know, driver behavior monitoring. So let's say a fleet owner wants to you know, make sure that the, the drivers are driving in a better way. You know, they're changing the gear the right, right manner so that you know, fuel consumption is minimized because you know, gear change has you know, a lot to do with that. Or they're safer, they have less accidents. So, so one of the things that, uh, that uh, we do is that you know, we, we, we create a loyalty program based on how you're driving and then you know, we let uh, other drivers you know, see that, like you know, um, fleet manager can set it up and, and because drivers drive, download an app on their you know, company phone and, and they can see that, you know, what others. And you, um, so we have an interesting game theoretic structures there, like you know, where um, you want a point um, when you drive well and you want a fraction of point when uh, your peers or your, your friends drive well. You want a point when you when you drive a clean vehicle in a mile, and you want a fraction of point when your friend drives a, a, a mile of you know with a clean vehicle. Now what happens is that um, you're creating an optimization problem with an objective function, where the objective function depends on the performance of um, not only you but also your your friends and family and, and peers. Now, if you look at that, um, you know, and then we create this sort of uh, different types of social tools that, you know, if somebody is really hurting your score, you can nudge them and things like that. So you have ways to create a social dynamics over there. Now, from an analytical perspective, you know, without getting into the symbols too much, but think about that, that you know, you're talking about um, a dynamical system where um, the objective function depends on this, you know, uh, the social behavior of that. And in order to optimize, you know, you cannot just simply improve your own performance. You have to do that, but also you have to make sure that your friends, you know, they improve too. So, um, you know, so now the questions are that, okay, what is the right kind of strategy in this thing? Should I incentivize uh, uh, one particular driver if um, that driver is actually um, driving very well and, and penalize everybody? Like, you know, that may not be the right thing to do for you. Because your goal as a fleet owner, for example, could be uh, to, uh, to make your entire fleet, of, fleet uh, pool of drivers a safer one. And same thing goes for the consumer market. Like, for example, we did a rollout with a, with a major you know, top 10 insurance company, um, and, and that was targeted for teenage drivers. And um, you know, this usage-based insurance in a, a tab that I had in, in one of the slides earlier, the conventional idea is that, okay, if you're a good driver, I'm gonna give you 15% um, off. Now that, you know, most insurance companies don't really like that because it cuts down their, their, their margin. They typically get about 4% margin. Um, and uh, it, you know, once you start giving this you know, incentive, it uh, comes down to in between two to 3%. And so there's more than 1% in a cut from their you know, margin. So a lot of this you know, programs you know, have to justify internally and work very hard to say the, you know, why is it worth uh, giving that, that break. So, so if you can create other types of incentive programs, and uh, also for the commercial place, you know, if you're trying to incentivize the entire group of drivers, not just one driver, incentivizing the best one may not be the right thing to do. So if you look at the things kind of that happens in, um, in things like you know, Google Ads, or, or without naming, since I'm on the camera, um, uh, so, so there are companies that incentivize you know, uh, advertisements, for example, using game theoretic tools, not necessarily incentivizing the, um, the, the, the highest bidder for a particular advertisement slot. Like, you know, if you are going to show, I'm sure you, you know, you've been to many websites where you, you see on the side advertisements. And uh, so there are computational advertisements, uh, management you know, algorithms that decide like you know, which algorithm to show. Right, and so do you always show the prime, you know, share, uh, share the prime spot for the um, advertisement, the highest bidders? You know, uh, it may not be so. 
Okay, so there are you know game theoretic you know uh, theorems you know that you use you know, which pays attention to other things like you know what is the gap between the the highest bidder and the second highest bidder and a whole bunch of other things. So you want to make sure that you you create uh, uh, a, a mechanism, a game theoretic mechanism that leads you towards the right kind of Nash equilibria, which uh, which is w w the 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 one that you want. You know, uh, so so there's like in you know, a fascinating amount of stuff happening on the on the social side you know both from the commercial uh, side and the consumer side uh, and, and you know apps and, and you know uh, smart apps with powered by machine learning algorithms and play an important role there I'm gonna skip that um, so this is um, uh, essentially the kind of stuff that that I was talking about like in terms of doing analytics for that like you know I think you know we all as a community we are barely scratching the surface of this I'll give you examples so one other thing that the fleet owners um, uh, typically use you know we have a link analysis tool so one other thing that we do is that um, okay so if you get uh, if a set of drivers get a you know, similar kind of scores so all of our score driver scores are in between 0 and 100 so let's say you know here's a group of drivers that got a score in between I mean, in between 60 and 65 now the next question is like you know why are they behaving in a similar manner so now can you correlate that with contextual data so link analysis techniques are well understood in, in data mining community for doing other things like you build a graphical model so for example Facebook you know um, LinkedIn they all do graphical analysis link analysis you know they all would say okay here is a you know subgraph and um, uh, and what are the common properties of this subgraph? You know, do they belong to the you know, same profession, same kind of gender, same area? So we, you can do those sort of stuff for vehicle telematics. Like you know, this group of drivers, you know, do they belong to the same fleet? Do they you know have the similar you know gender, similar age group? Do they belong to the? Uh, did they get their training from the same program? So there are a whole bunch of things that you could do around that. So. Um, both for the consumer and uh, and the commercial place, you know, this is this is an interesting interesting area. And these screenshots that you see, these are some of the the link analysis techniques and you know, visualizations that we have there. Um, I'll say a few words about um, our CRM system, and then you know, maybe you know, so then we'll pick up a uh, a particular area and, and drill down. Um, uh, so and talk about some algorithmic stuff. So this is the the mine cards here, and this is the the, the portal for the the dealers. So their goal uh, is to is to make money essentially from the vehicle health data. So uh, you know how do you uh, if you're getting vehicle health data uh, from 10,000 vehicles and you are a car dealer and you are the last person on the face of the earth who would be interested in, in data analytics, for example, because their goal is to make money from that thing. Okay, so what kind of things that you can do? Uh, because at the end of the day, you need to translate in their language; otherwise, they're not going to write you a check, right? So, um, and, and um, uh, so I'll give you an example. You know, so let's say so one of the things that they want to do typically is that uh, uh, they want to send you coupons based on your needs. Right, so uh, they would probably have like you know 30 different services, and uh, you need to match them with, um, uh, with with the car owner's need. So if the car owner needs a an oxygen sensor, then you know you would uh, you'd like to send them a coupon for oxygen sensor and say if you show up in the next you know 48 hours, I'll give you 15 percent off. So that's that's the the theory, but the actual execution is a lot more complicated. I'll give you an example. So what if the um, what if my car, let's say, has an oxygen sensor problem, and um, and I get a coupon um, for this fifteen percent off thing? And what if my car's valuation is pretty low? So let's say the car is pretty old, beaten up, and the car's valuation is just fifteen hundred euros. Okay. And uh, so one other thing that we do is that you know, we kind of um, uh, do automated repair cost estimate. And so we would know, let's say, it takes about you know, you know 400 euros to fix oxygen sensor. And um, so now, if somebody is telling me that, hey, spend another 400 euro on a 1500 euro car, which is pretty old, beaten up, I would probably say, uh, 
I'm not going to spend that thing. I'm going to get rid of this car. I'm going to buy a new car, right? It's already a pretty old thing. So that's an example of an analytic where you're combining a piece of vehicle health telematics data that your oxygen sensor is not working, combining that with two pieces of financial data, like the valuation data of the car, you know, uh, and you know the repair cost estimate. And we would combine that with a few other things and we do a Bayesian likelihood score. But how likely are you to come to the service bay for a repair job? So, so instead of, you know, you know, if you're not likely, then instead of sending you a coupon for you know, uh, fixing the oxygen sensor, maybe I should be getting a coupon for buying a new car. And uh, so that sort of opens up a lot of you know, opportunities for monetization and, and you know, very personalized services. Because if you are opening up telematic services and connected car services, you don't want to you know, water torture your, your um, clients you know, with you know, hundreds of these advertisements and things like that. They'll just completely turn off. Okay? Uh, and uh, at the end of the day for the OEMs, that brand management is very important. You don't want to annoy them, right? You can't uh, um, spam them. So, so that's the kind of analytics um, that, uh, that can really make this sort of connected car services very personalized, very powerful. So that, that's the kind of stuff that you know, we try to do in, in, in Mindcar. Uh, but this is really another fascinating you know, research area. Um, and um, um, I talked about the repair cost estimate, which, is, which itself is a, is a difficult, challenging problem. Um, why so? Because in a, in a, if somebody asks me, okay, uh, for a you know, uh, Volvo car, like, you know, what's the price of um, the air filter? That's easy to say. You know, there are databases that just put the parts number, they'll tell you what's, how much it's going to cost in which country. Now, if you are going to map it uh, from uh, from the trouble codes, the DTC codes, you know, in other words, uh, and the, um, the what what are the parts that are likely have you know, failed? That is not a one-to-one -one mapping. So that typically involves probabilistic analysis, um, you know, looking at the the likelihood distribution. So because typically, you, know, you have a fault tree. They're like you know, so there are multiple possibilities, and then so you need to bring in empirical data, estimate the distribution, and based on some of the uh, the sensor data, you probably try you know you, you do a maximum maximum likelihood estimate, things like that. So that's um, that itself is a is a challenging problem. And we spent many years on that, and then finally communicating that to the user itself that that that's also a, ch a challenging problem because I was just talking you know, before the talk uh, that. Um, um, that first of all, communicating that this is a probabilistic decision is is uh, is uh, is challenging from the human computer interaction side of the story. Um, so so the presentation has to be done in a certain way. So I, I have like you know many other you know stuff to talk about. What I'm going to do. Um, so I think I pretty much you know touched up on you know many of these things. Um, one thing I want to point out that I haven't really talked about, and probably this talk I'll skip that. So correlating. Uh, vehicle performance data with the location data is also another interesting area. Like one other thing that we do uh, for our fleet customers is that you know we kind of correlate uh, driver behavior with location. So fuel consumption, you know, what are the fuel consumption hotspots? Like where are you burning most of your fuel, and because of what? Okay, uh, and uh, so there are a whole bunch of things that you could do around that, um, correlating fuel consumption data with driver behavior data. You know, you take your full consumption distribution, correlate that with driver behavior, build predictive models, multivariate models, optimize that and say, okay, you know, here's a speed distribution. What if you could tweak it a little bit? You know, what if you spend like, you know, 5% less time um, in between, you know, 75 and, and 80 miles per hour? Uh, then how much money would you save exactly? And that is very important uh, for the ROI, you know. How much money would you save? Not just some based on some rules of thumbs from technical report, um, in a but for your vehicle, for your vehicle's health condition. Um, so that's that's where a lot of you know, uh, empirical modeling can play a role. Um, so what I'm going to do next, you know, I'm going to um, drill down um, on on, um, on on a uh, problem from. Uh, the insurance market, a and to talk about you know, uh, some algorithmic issues and, and some uh, use some symbols uh, um, and to, uh, 
that's my core interest you know I'm, I'm an algorithm guy so uh, I still feel kind of bad like in a if I'm not in a talk if I'm not you know doing a little bit of math on that so so uh, bear with me I'll just you know have a little fun over here and then um, talk about that so um, so usage based insurance we talked about that right so uh, so almost all major insurance companies are you know getting into this you know the octo telematics deal that I just talked about they just got bought by uh, Innova uh, uh, Renova group from Russia um, uh, octo is a an insurance facing telematics infrastructure company from Italy okay and uh, so so this um, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on so I, you know, in this uh, particular slide you know, I have like in a bunch of screenshots from our mind drive um, product this is a product designed for the actuaries the insurance actuaries so this is designed for people with background in data science they they understand this stuff so this is uh, so we talk their language so that that's relatively easy so um, so it's not as challenging as communicating with the fleet managers for example um, so so among other things we do driver scoring so driver scoring means like you, know, you take your driver behavior data how you're speeding how you're taking turns how are you cornering how are you tailgating okay um, I'll show you a slide on the tailgating stuff in a minute and, and um, then we would sort of correlate that with your claims data like you know how much money did you charge the insurance company last year and build predictive models and uh, so there's a well understood process for the actuaries to to do loss correlated scoring so we you know we do those sort of stuff we do a lot of um, so in order to do that you need to do a lot of you know, short term analysis of the driver behavior long term analysis for the driver behavior that sort of stuff and i have some screenshots over here i will you know skip that discussion i'll talk about those things in in, in a uh, more detailed uh, version so so this is um one of the little things that, that we do it's kind of fun um, so that's uh, you know in the freeways like when you tailgate like you know I don't know if you've done that ever like you know come behind a, a car and then you know flash your headlights I'm sure all of you are very good drivers you probably have never done that I guess you know um, and, and so that's the behavior I'm talking about okay and that has a very interesting periodic signature in your uh, in your uh, data so so this is sort of a, a, a you know, power spectra, the Fourier analysis, not not a you know, technically very you know, uh, different things, but I'm sure you're familiar with that stuff, Fourier analysis. So this is uh, the normal behavior, and when you have uh, this is a power spectrum of the tailgating behavior. So so there are like um, so what we would do is that we would do this sort of time series analysis, extract features from that, and then correlate that uh, with the uh, with the last data and see what kind of correlation do you have in the short term, um, what kind of long term correlations that you have. So so that's part of the things um, that we do we also take this sort of um, characteristics and, and, and features and then we do comparative analysis so so this is over here you're looking at a two-dimensional scatter plot where each dot represents a, a particular driver now this is not location data or anything like that this is uh, multivariate analysis so you have like in a um, whole bunch of driver behavior features that you're collecting from your you know driving and then we are looking at your covariance matrix and doing diagonal analysis of that taking the top dominant eigenvectors projecting along the the top two eigenvectors here so this is sort of like a control map if you will uh, where you know, two dimensions represent uh, the, the principal components the top two eigenvectors of the covariance matrix and uh, so once you project all the drivers in this 2d space then each dot represents a driver and you can do you know clustering outlier detection so this is a textbook case okay so you know nothing fancy so so but a lot of this you know uh, analysis uh, happen okay and, and that's what we do um, so one other thing that we need to do is that you know for driver behavior data for vehicle health monitoring we, we need to compute this um, covariance matrices um, so it's a you know basic textbook aggregate statistics in a computing correlation matrix and covariance matrix in a, I'm sure all of you know about that now that computation is very important for many of the things that we do including this and the other important thing is that you um, uh, know most cars most trucks are kind of predictable you know they're electromechanical systems and and uh, they're predictable that's why you drive them right otherwise if they're changing their behavior all the time <laughs> hands off right you don't want to do that so we're fundamentally talking about you know, more or less stationary distribution probabilistic you know probabilistically right 
so they converge so converge to um, the covalence matrix would converge after some time and the eigenvectors will kind of stay same now occasionally when things bad things happen uh, or you do bad things your um, uh, your eigenvectors you know, may change right so so monitoring the top two eigenvectors are, are important you know monitoring the correlation matrix or the covariance matrix for detecting changes is very important so you gotta quickly generate uh, detect the changes and then maybe the computer do whatever it is if you detect a change so change detection is very important and uh, even if you have a powerful um, device like you know this one has like a, a, a brew um, operating system from Qualcomm more than 100 megs of storage um, you know multi-threaded you know operating system you know so it's pretty decent powerful device and um, even for those guys like you know, if you take a, if you're monitoring a time series data and you have like you know in between the spatial and the temporal features you have 100 features computing a 100 by 100 correlation matrix so it might involve an autocorrelation compo component and a cross correlation component that is a non-trivial problem if you use a desktop algorithm like the kind of stuff that that's used for you know, computing and to monitoring correlation matrices let's say from stock market data um, that is a luxury in this kind of stuff even with all the, the powerful stuff that you have. So, so one other thing that you know, we did over the last you know, 15 years and we spent a lot of time doing analytics in this you know, uh, resource constraint devices. So, um, so I'm going to talk about that in the next few slides. So the, the, uh, this slide talks about like you know, learning decision trees and in, insurance, in, in I'm going to skip that. Um, so, um, so that's uh, uh, so let, let, let's get to that that uh, correlation and um, uh, matrix or covariance matrix monitoring problem. So now that and I talk about correlation slash inner product matrix monitoring. So because in a inner product, uh, the correlation matrix computation or the covariance matrix computation can be posed as an inner product computation. If you just write down the matrix form, you can normalize it and you're gonna see that it's an inner product. So inner product is kind of beautiful. It's, it just shows up in so many things. Um, if you look at like, you know, things like Euclidean distance computation, that can be post, um, posed as an inner product computation problem. So a lot of this, you um, know, statistical aggregates or, or machine learning or data stream mining problems that we deal with on board the vehicle and also in the back end. You know, uh, you know, we typically try to, if you look at the literature for distributed data mining, they typically try to kind of decompose those things to basic primitives like inner product computation. Um, you know, and to, uh, and then try to um, create efficient algorithms around that. So um, I'll give you an example over here. So, so correlation matrix can be posed as in a product matrix computation. So it, let's say and I have a data matrix X, so I'm kind of abstracting the problem now, okay? And then a product computation is sort of like an X transpose X, okay? And, um, um, and uh, so now, um, so so so, uh, is it cites some of the work in a stat stream, you know, which is a correlation monitoring algorithm from New York University, but that was designed for you know, sort of you know, Wall Street uh, stock market data stream. Their algorithm doesn't really you know fit in with, with what we're doing, but you know, just uh, another li uh, literature data point. So wanted to cite that. Um, so so what we really want to do is that you know we want to uh, quickly detect changes. In the correlation matrix or the inner product matrix and then if we identify that this part of the correlation matrix has changed and then and then we're going to go back and recompute that okay and um, um and so um so what i'm going to talk about i'm going to talk about a, a quick change detection algorithm that sort of de deploys a you know randomized technique um Sort of when it blends a randomized technique with with a divide and conquer kind of technique, you know, um, and, and that we 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 use uh, for many things. Um, so it fundamentally it kind of exploits the fact that you know large random vectors are, are almost orthogonal to each other. So if you generate two vectors, let's say, where each entry is a coin flip, let's say, it takes a value. Of plus one with 0.5 probability and minus one with 0.5 probability. And uh, you generate two vectors, compute the inner product, the dot product between these two vectors. 
in C that you know, once you, you know, uh, if you compute this in a product and take an average over multiple trials, you're going to see a value close to zero. Okay, so that is an observation which led to many, many different types of algorithms, beautiful algorithms. So large random vectors are almost orthogonal to each other. That's one other thing that we kind of exploit here, which is a known thing. And the goal is to identify a region of the matrix you know, that contain you know, significantly changed coefficients. So that's the goal. So, um, so, so this slide essentially talks about this you know, approximate inner product computation, and which is based on this um, uh, the fact that large random vectors are almost orthogonal. So, so, so uh, let's look at this problem a little bit analytically. So let's say I have two vectors. One is like a1 through an, so two you know, real valued numbers, you know, uh, two real valued vectors. So this a1, a2, these are real valued numbers. And uh, it could be integer two. And this is another vector, b1 through bn. So I have two vectors, and I want to compute the, um, the inner product between these two, the dot product between these two vectors. So it's a textbook thing. So, um, and all I have to do is that multiply a1 with b1, and then add it to a2 times b2, and then you know, continue adding, and that's my dot product, right? So that's the exact dot product. Now, what if I want to compute that uh, quickly? You know, um, multiplications you know, um, are kind of expensive, so you're doing a lot of uh, multiplications over there. So, what if I want to speed it up, but I'm willing to you know, allow a little bit of error in that? And um, so, I'm going to generate a probabilistic version of that. So, what I'm going to do is that you know, I'm going to flip the signs of each of these, um, each of these um, numbers in these two vectors randomly with the coin flip and that can be efficient implemented so I flip a coin and to, uh, with 0.5 probability I'm going to uh, keep the sign of a1 as is and with another 0.5 probability I'm going to ch flip the sign so it's equivalent to multiplying a1 by a random variable j1 where j1 takes either a plus 1 or a minus 1 value with 0.5 probability for each so I'm going to do the same thing with, you know, with this vector you know, with the same random seed so what I'm going to do over here, after flipping the signs randomly, I'm just simply going to add them. So a bunch of additions. You can see the multiplications. And once I add them, I get, you know, from this vector, I'm going to get Z1K. And from this vector, I'm going to get Z2K. Okay, two scalars. All I did is just flip the signs randomly, uniform probability, and add them. So from the left column, I'm going to get a single scalar, call it Z1K. From the right column, I'm going to get a single scalar, a Z2K. So two scalars. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply these two scalars, Z1K times Z2K. So one multiplication. And now I'm going to just I'm going to repeat this experiment a few times and take an average of this multiplication. That will be a pretty good estimate of the inner product. And you can prove that the, um, the error in the estimate, you know, the expected value, um, is going to, you know, the error is going to come down, it's going to converge, and so there are proofs in variance also comes down. So, so there are, you can bound those things. So what we just did is that you know, we took two vectors and figured out a quick um, way with a lot less number of floating point multiplications, um, just by one multiplication, bunch of additions. Uh, and repeating that few times, taking an average, and I have a pretty good estimate of the inner product. Okay, so why did I talk about that? Because you know, now I'm going to use that primitive for uh, designing a, a divide and conquer type algorithm on the correlation matrix or the covariance matrix or the inner product matrix. So, so what I want to do is that somehow I want to take like you know correlation matrix for example. It has um, so if I have like you know uh, two features x1 and x2, and um, if I want to compute the correlation, it's a two by two matrix, right? And with the diagonal terms representing you know the auto correlation, the and the, the off diagonals the cross correlations, right? So um, same thing for the the variance, you know, uh, the covariance. The diagonal terms represent the variance, and the off diagonal terms represent the the, the cross term the variance. So I want to impose a tree-like structure on this matrix and group these coefficients 
under this in a different branches of the tree okay so imagine a tree where the root node of the tree represents all the coefficients that you have in the correlation matrix okay and so essentially the nodes in this tree are associated with a, a, a unique in a subset of variables so the root node is associated with x1 x2 in this two-dimensional problem so you know all the you know, correlation coefficients that we have like four of them you know and um, is a matrix so the off dangle terms are identical but doesn't matter so they're all covered under the root node of the tree but then as you come down to the subtree you know one represents x1 the other one represents x2 and if you had more than two then it will be a deeper tree with uh, with with subsets of um, uh, different uh, variables that you have defining the correlation matrix okay so you can look at like you know um, the you know all the different nodes and, and you know where each node represents a, a valid unique subset of variables so now um, I'll just share this result and, and um, so the way you know, so here's um, so look at the symbols and it says that given a set of subset of attributes x1 through xk and um, and a random uh, vector sigma bar you know sigma 1 through sigma k these are essentially random vectors where let's say the entries are um, plus ones and minus ones with 0.5 probability or a real valid random variables with uniform distribution that will do too and I want to compute this vector s which is in a x bar sigma bar t so both of them are defined just simple coin flipping essentially what I showed you earlier in the previous slide and uh, you can uh, prove this result you know where you know, it basically says that the, the variance uh, uh, the square of that you know of s if you sum it up over you know this um, um, you know uh, a, a group of variables you know from p1 to r for you know, r variables and take an average of that that essentially approximates the correlation the, the sum of the square of the correlation coefficients between every pair l and q in this in between uh, p and r so let me try to translate so if you take a group of variables and you know, x1 through let's say you know, x5 x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 you know consider all pairwise correlation coefficients in between x1 and x2 in between x1 and x3 x1 and x4 x1 and x5 and then x2 and x3 all those pairs the sum of the square of this correlation individual pair of correlation coefficients is approximated by a um, the variance term over over the randomly flipped uh, set of variables x1 through x5 okay so so now what i'm doing is that you know i'm doing this you know this is essentially a random projection right you know multiplying you know uh, x bar by you know sigma bar where sigma bar is you know vectors of plus ones and minus ones with uniform probability right so i can in a easy relatively easily compute this term from uh, the random projection and get an estimate of this the sum of the square of this correlation pairwise correlation coefficients now why is that important because the individual term that i have correlation correlation coefficient between a pair of random variables it can take a value in between plus one and minus one right you know negative correlation positive correlation but if i take a square of that it's always going to be a non-negative number right so you know if this thing is estimated to be a non-zero number below some threshold value there is no way that all the terms over here um, in a, in a, in a, so this this terms over here the square individual terms in a, since they're squared they're all non-negative so they cannot cancel each other out right so if this is equal to zero let's say then there's no way that this term is going to be equal to you know uh, the, the individual terms over there are going to cancel each other because you know uh, everything has to be zero because this is square right so so that's the observation so so now i have a tree like structure starting from the root node i'm going to apply this test and i'm going to basically prune out the elements the subtrees um, which basically say this particular this particular node um, this is close to zero 
So if it's close to zero, that means I, I can say that all the, the, the pairwise correlation coefficients that are subsumed within that particular subtree, they're, they're all negligible. I'll, you know, uh, so note that you know, we're trying to do change detection. So changes are going to be kind of minimal over there. So you can design an algorithm based on that, which will essentially prune out a bunch of things. And I'll say, okay, but this part, I, you know, I didn't get a zero, this part of the subtree. So what I can go there and then I can go there and compute, recompute the correlation coefficients for that particular subsystem, the of features. Does that make sense? Yes. So R is the number of times you compute S? Um, that's right. So this is, um, uh, we are averaging it out. Yeah, exactly. So, um, all right. So um, all those um, law of large numbers, things like that, those things kind of kick in over there. You can, you know, um, you, you need that averaging process. Okay. They kind of exponentially come down. So the error goes down there. Yeah, that's the number of trials. So that's, um, um, you, know, you know, how we would sort of, um, monitor many of many of our you know uh, uh, things uh, wherever we need to sort of monitor this is sort of the open version of the story of course um, so that's a tree that I was re referring to and we would be pruning out different subtrees as we sort of go down and and uh, uh, monitor the ones that uh, uh, that requires computing and recompute those things and um, so this is a, a pretty interesting general approach for um, quickly detecting things that you need to, that, that things that have changed, that, that you need to recompute. Uh, if you want to sort of exactly estimate using the probabilistic distribution, you need you know, more sampling, so we usually try to avoid it, but if we detect, you know, quickly that this part needs to be recomputed, we could just go and recompute that stuff, brute force. So this is a, an example of the kind of stuff uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that we do and to, there are really fascinating kinds of algorithm problems so there they, I and mean, i just talked about you know one particular slice of what we do on board um but uh, uh you know doing data analysis for connected cars you know given the current stage of the field uh, i think we're just we just barely scratch the surface. There's just you, know, you guys are doing fascinating stuff, and you have learned a lot of things today. Um, and, and there are many other interesting groups that are uh, working in these things. So there is uh, a lot of things to um, to do. So this um, slide essentially kind of summarizes um, uh, some of the areas where uh, you know, there are many algorithmic challenges, and you know, of course, uh, on the business side, those of you who are interested and. To, uh, there are, you know, there is no scarcity of challenges in uh, in translating these things to uh, to businesses and, and uh, finance. Um, so that's um, that's all I have for for today. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Thanks for your patience, and if you have any questions, I'd love to take it. Huh? Sure. For your. Uh, where you show the two eigenvectors for uh, a driver scoring, what kind of uh, sensors or signals go into the all the data that you get the eigenvectors from? Okay, um, sure. So, so the the raw driver behavior data comes from, for example, um, uh, your accelerometer. You know your. Um, from the vehicle provides like in your speed and vehicle provides RPM, the gear information, those sort of stuff. Um, and uh, so uh, there are like, you know, some stuff that uh, that are coming in terms of the user experience at, this, at the time because how you drive, that also depends on what you're trying to do at the same time. Um, so there are those sort of, uh, those sort of st stuff, how many miles you're driving, those sort of stuff. But then you sort of like, you know, process them and extract features from them. Right. Um, so before they get into the clustering stuff, uh, you have uh, your basic parameters like speed and things like that. But mostly, you know, we have a lot of you know, processed features. Like for example, uh, I showed you a slide on Fourier analysis. So you take you know things like you know, wavelet uh, transformation, Fourier transformation, um, extract the, the dominant coefficients and, and use. So those sort of meta level features. So those are the things that kind of get into the clustering side. And typically insurance companies, they would also um, look at uh, this stuff in the contextual data. 
So there are like, you know, today most insurance companies would score you um, not based on telematics data, of course, because these are relatively new programs. So most of the traditional insurance companies, traditional programs are based on your context data, like your um, your age, for example. And so those sort of uh, features also get into the the the, uh, the models and the, the clusterings, like. Um, for example, where you drive internationally, we, we segment that. You know, is it a urban area? Is it a rural area? Is it a high risk area? Um, a typical trip would have like a whole bunch of things like you know, the time. You know, are you spending a lot of time during the peak office hours? Or are you driving a lot of hours during the late uh, night? So, so a lot of those things also get into the, the analysis stuff, the clustering stuff. It, it actually fundamentally is, is it depends on um, the objective. There's no need to kind of unnecessarily clutter the feature space. The moment you add an extra feature, it makes your algorithmic challenges harder. So it depends on the ROI. Okay, what are you trying to deliver? And uh, what's the dollar amount or the euro amount that you're trying to save? And so based on that, you do feature selections and create that vertical. But those are some of the, the typical raw features that we deal with. Okay. okay? Any other questions? Yes. So when you, for example, talked about this uh, insurance thing, this requires kind of three parties to be involved. It requires somebody who does the analytics. It requires the uh, insurance company, but it also in the, in, includes the drivers. They have to agree to have this kind of data collecting tool. Right? So how, how can you see this? Because in a sense, they don't necessarily have to like this idea of that I'm, I'm now getting controlled all the time. I have to be more careful because if I'm driving the way I like to drive, I'm paying more. Mm -hmm. how, how does that... that that's, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question. So, so we spent a lot of time just doing this thing because, you know, for example, for smaller fleets, we don't see that as a major problem because typically the owners usually kind of say, hey, this is part of your job and I'm going to do that. But for larger fleets where you have like, you know, strong un unions, you know, uh, for example, if you look at, you know, New York City taxi cabs, and they have a lot of say, okay, on how this thing is going to be. So, so we um, uh, we have seen in the early days, like you know, people trying to kind of um, push hard on that thing, like you know, and some of them got pushbacks from unions, and and so for example, there was a lot of pushback initially from GPS-based location monitoring. But now, if you look at that, like you know, almost every major city, the taxi cab systems they have a GPS. Okay, so so it's uh, so typically, I think the successful uh, executions in a typically have a driver incentive program. So um, that's where we've seen high adoption, like you know, um, make them a stakeholder in this thing. Say that, okay, this is my policy. For example, even in the consumer market, like we have a very transparent privacy policy. You own the data. The and if you put a device like this from at and or Sprint, um, then you are in charge. We have a privacy policy, and if you say that, hey, I'm interested in sharing my vehicle health data with my car dealers and because I want them to compete for my, um, my business, then only you know, it goes there, otherwise not. So same thing for the commercial fleets. If you make the drive, you know, driver say, a stakeholder, for example, if they save, let's say five cents uh, um, you know, per gallon of gas, you know, give them a cent. Through, you know, you know this, this, the incentive programs have been phenomenally successful in our experience. Um, even simple things like you know, movie tickets, weekly tournaments for um, the best drivers recognizing that, um, you know, giving like small incentives, uh, they go a long way. And we have seen like, you know, a lot of you know, pushbacks and, and when the executives try to push uh, a hard battle. And so I think as long as uh, you create uh, an incentive structure, um, and, and they sort of do the proper education that this is, this is not going to violate your privacy and these are the company policies, uh, pretty sooner or later it works out. There will always be some pushback. But in that case, like most of the rational drivers, you know, would sort of um, accept that. We have seen also like in you know, a self-insured vehicles, like, you know, for example, where in the US, for example, we have a lot of um, truck owners who own the truck, but they work for trucking companies. 
and those self-insured drivers they are actually using it because they are um, uh, so so you just need to create you know the right kind of incentive programs that's that's my two cents any other question yeah so you have talked about five business applications i have understood uh, insurance consumer fleet owner a dealer and oem so have you thought about another potential business application or these are defined right now? Those are the things that we openly talk about. Okay. Why, you have ideas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have really good ideas, think hard and uh, don't talk about it. No, it's right now. <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. Um, I was just kidding. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there are many things that are happening right now. Um, if you look at the, the social side of the story, that the kind of location-based services that are, that are, the bottom line is this, like um, the moment you start mashing telematics data with a lot of non-telematics data, like in the financial domain, for example, okay, a um, lot of stuff happening right now. So um, if you look at um, a major European energy company is working with us, uh, uh, so when you pull up your uh, car to the gas station, Okay, on average, um, uh, a, a driver, a car owner, uh, you know, goes to um, goes to a gas station two and a half times a month. They spend on average about eight minutes in the gas station filling up filling up the gas station. So when you go pull up a gas station, I don't know if you've seen most modern gas stations, they have an LCD panel. They show you advertisements of Coca-Cola or Pepsi and things like that, right? The question is, should they be showing you those kind of generic ads? or if you're driving a, 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 a portion of red convertible as opposed to you know, driving a you know, you know, Ford Focus, uh, you know, they should be showing you very personalized ads. Um, you know, so, so the moment you have a car connected to a wireless network, those things open up. Like, you know, the moment you go up there, stand in, in front of uh, the gas station, you swipe your card, action begins right so you got like in you know, a eight minutes of you know undivided attention you have no other way to go right and you just have to stand there right <laughs> so right so there are like um that fascinating kind of stuff happening on that front um on um, uh, vehicle to infrastructure side you know uh, a lot of things happening uh you know michigan just uh, uh launched uh, pretty much finished the first phase of the uh, the vehicle to vehicle uh, a, a control rollout in the city of Ann Arbor. On that front, like you know, many European countries are working on that, Australia. Yeah. So it, it is uh, a lot of like then, like you know, if you, you know, over here, we're talking about distributed computing systems, but still you have a you know, central backend that's talking to all these things. Now, the moment you have peer to peer structure, um, and somebody comes up with an, you know, with an application where it is. Um, uh, very peer-to-peer -peer oriented like think about the ride share kind of stuff right there's still client server models right now you know, you, your app talks to the back end um, but you know you can do a peer-to-peer -peer stuff and so you have to come up with interesting business model for that who pays for that who is going to you know drive your business so so in terms of the data analytics in the background uh, in infrastructures a uh, lot of stuff happening I think the stories are like you know how do you create business models out of that okay so uh, if you have ideas, uh, pursue those. And, to, and, and to, uh, but my suggestion is like coming from academia and pure theorem proving. My advisor, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, he comes from analytical background. And uh, so I mean, we have been trained to kind of do that sort of stuff. Uh, but one of the things that I learned is that uh, most of the outside world don't really care about how beautiful your theorems are, okay? And so you have to translate those things in in plain 30-second elevator pitch. So, um, so, so also think about that human interaction side of the story, uh, because your ideas are going to materialize if you can uh, convince people to write checks or you know define ROIs. So think about both, and uh, if you need. Any you know, question or any help, just uh, let me know. All right. Any other questions?
Yes. Yeah, I have one uh, thought about um, the example you gave with the oxygen sensor on the car, and you had a health monitoring system, and you're teaming up with uh, with the dealer and sending coupons. But I mean, if it's a predictive function, then the customer should know there. I mean, if the customer he probably doesn't know that there is a problem with his car, but the the algorithms have figured that out. So how do you? I mean, selling sending them a coupon on on a cheaper repair when the customer doesn't know there is a need for repair mm -hmm. is a very challenging task. Absolutely. So so it's absolutely very important. So that's why what we do is that all of our systems they're kind of in the back end they connect with each other. The Wink system, for example, that I showed you earlier. Um, uh, let me see. So this stuff, this the apps, these are they're all consumer facing. So customer would actually know. So on the consumer portal, um, you, you would see that in your car has a, a vehicle health problem. This is the estimated cost. So we would educate them at the same time. Like if they say that okay, I want to. So now that I know that my car has this problem, um, you know who is interested for my business? Okay. So that's where the B two B things come into the picture. So, okay. So you already presented the customer with a problem and then. Yeah. Yeah. Sold the information to another party and selling them. Right. Sending them the coupon. Right. And some of the B two B channels, even what they're doing is that they're showing the customer the problem, and then they also show you a link on the side that hey, you know, here's the nearby stores where you can get this thing fixed, and here's the corresponding coupon for that if you. So, yeah, but that is that user interaction is very important. Yeah. I also had a question around these specific coupons. Um, it seems to me like th th this is more uh, uh, towards private consumers, because they're perhaps more interested in micromanagement of, of the costs and so on. How, how would you deal with fleet owners? Uh, how, how would that be interfaced? Or I mean, because they typically may perhaps are not so interested in micromanagement. They just want to have guaranteed vehicle uptime and so on. Uh, right, right. So, so you know, most large fleets they would have already sort of contracted uh, either contracted out either an you know external uh, repair entity or or internal in-house you know uh, uh, repair shops. So, so, so it's a different kind of business model over there. So, I think most for commercial fleets like the major the ROIs are, for example. Uh, in a fuel consumption minimization, so that's important. Um, driver safety is uh, another important part, and then comes to the vehicle health side in our experience in that order. So what is the so if, you know, typically a fleet owner says, okay, we're going to install some of this in a not not necessarily the OBD but the J1939 and J1708 heavy duty uh, devices um, or the OEM installed infrastructure. Then uh, where does ROI come from, right? So those are the ones, and they will typically like run this thing for a few months and then define the ROI. And so okay, uh, so that's how you know deals are closed there. But that's sort of the orderings in which you know the ROIs are defined here. Yeah. I mean, couponing and those sort of stuff work in a very different way for the commercial fleets, not this way. Any other questions? All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to hand you this small gift. Okay. Let's <laughs> give you a gift here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.